A Patriot's Faith, Chapter 12 Carson Lee stood at the podium, Joel McAdams by his side. Carson felt dirty, standing aligned with the majority leader. Truth is, he couldn't stand McAdams, or the politics he embraced. Carson had known him to be self-serving, motivated merely by his own personal and political gain. Everything he believed in, everything he stood for and did, was to serve his own agenda, to build his own wealth and his own political capital. Carson smiled as he waved to the crowd. Inside, he was empty. He had resigned himself to the belief that he was done with politics, done with Washington, D.C., and done with men like Senator Joel McAdams. Yet here he was, standing arm in arm with all he detested, arm in arm with Joel McAdams, Washington, D.C., and everything that represented a corrupt, morally bankrupt nation. Today, he stood knee-deep in the putrid, festering, tepid waters of the nation's swamp. Paul Connor stood behind him, looking back and forth out over the crowd, watching intently. As Carson addressed the mass of people assembled here today, he looked out and he noticed Ken Fowler and two of his security detail standing not too far out from the stage. They blended into the crowd perfectly as the gray men that they had designed themselves to be today. Standing in close proximity to them was Conrad Laramie, retired senator from Mississippi, Carson's friend and mentor. Senator Laramie had been retired now for almost two years. As Carson saw him in the crowd, he remembered all that he had taught him, all that he instilled in him when he first came to Washington. Carson was thankful to have had the advantage of knowing him. This city had a way of devouring good, honest men and spitting them out into the gutter in the wake of the grotesquely ugly beast that was the political machine of Washington, D.C. Conrad Laramie was a man of principle, a man of integrity. He was a rare commodity, even back then, almost 12 years ago. Conrad stood in his blue suit, covered with a long overcoat, wearing his ball cap that read, We Are America, which was the slogan that had become the catchphrase of Carson's service during his time in the Senate. Carson couldn't help but think to himself, did anyone here even remember this great man and his service to this country? Conrad Laramie had a long and distinguished career in the Senate. He was a true patriot who stood to uphold our Constitution and the principles it represents. The principles that our founding fathers had envisioned for this once great nation. Since his retirement, Senator Laramie had seemingly faded into obscurity. Carson himself remembered thinking many times that this great man, this champion of democracy, had just walked away one day and had not looked back. Carson remembered thinking, who could blame him? He remembered thinking that his friend had simply had enough of this circus, that he had been burnt out from his years of tireless service to this nation. He now knew better, however that he had not given up, that he had not walked away, that he had only shifted roles. Carson now knew that his friend had been called into higher service, even though he wasn't aware of the scope or the commitment of that service just yet. Truth be told, it was this realization that solidified Carson's decision to join Ken Fowler and his group to continue to fight for the nation he loved, the nation that he and Paul had grown up in, 
and which was rapidly being transformed into something unrecognizable, into something that Carson didn't want to be part of. Yes, in fact, Carson had ultimately decided when he joined Ken's group that the nation he loved and remembered was worth fighting for. He threw his hands up in the air and shouted, We are America! And the crowd cheered and chanted, Six more years! in unison. Paul touched the earbud in his right ear with his fingertips. He looked up and stepped forward, placing his right hand on Carson's shoulder. It's time, sir, he stated. The two men turned abruptly and walked off stage, seemingly catching Senator McAdams by surprise. Before anyone could fully react, they walked down the rear steps of the platform and the short few steps to where the Yukon pulled up and parked in front of them. Paul opened the door for Carson, and the two men got in the SUV. Seconds later, it was gone, heading out of town for the airport. They arrived 20 minutes later and boarded the luxury jet that belonged to Trans Alaska Fuels and Carson's former college buddy, James Darling. The jet had been arranged by Ken Fowler, who, with his two-man security detail, were on board as well. About 40 minutes into the flight, the security chief came in over the intercom. Mr. Fowler, I have Bryce Leonard on the sat phone for you, sir. Ken Fowler punched the button on the console in front of him. Send it through, Jesse. A little static was heard followed by Bryce's raspy voice. Ken, it's Bryce here. Are we secure to talk? Ken answered. Go ahead, Bryce. I got Carson and Paul here with me, as well as Pastor Scanlon and my security detail. You're clear to speak freely. I've been trying to run down the Yukon from the abduction in Portland the other day. I can't trace it back to anyone. The plates came back empty like they didn't exist. A big surprise there. Uh, But about an hour ago, we received a video. It was originally sent to our contact member's P.O. box in Portland. Uh, It ain't good, Pastor. The video shows your three friends uh, being executed. We verified its authenticity. Hasn't been altered in any way. Also, because of it being sent to our contacts P.O. box, strongly suggests that they know about the group, or at least a faction of it. Nothing came in with it, no statements or demands or anything, just the video. I'm sorry, Pastor. Ken Fowler paused as he considered the situation. Well, we've been getting resistance in that region for a while now. This could be the tipping point. Tell the ops chief in the region to kick up the communications protocols in the area to the next level. I want our people sharp out there. Also, stay on the Yukon, Bryce. I know it's a long shot, but it's all we have. Detach a detail from Section 7 to the area, ASAP. Keep it under wraps. I want them operational independent from the group. Free up whatever manpower we can send to them as well, Ken ordered. Bryce answered, Roger that, sir. Ken pushed another button on the desktop console, and the call disconnected. He looked up at Jim Scanlon. I'm sorry, Pastor, I know what these guys meant to you. You have the group's condolences, as well as mine personally. We will do everything we can. To figure out who did this. Pastor Scanlon nodded. He folded his hands and began to pray. When the plane landed in the small private airstrip outside Anchorage, the men filed off the jet together. Pastor Scanlon put his hand on Carson's shoulder and said, Carson, uh, are you and Paul free to accompany me on a short trip this weekend? I want to leave after Sunday evening service. We should be back by Tuesday morning.
Carson looked at Paul, who nodded affirmatively. Then he answered, uh, Sure, Pastor, where are we going? Pastor Scanlon told him that they would be flying down to Bismarck, North Dakota. I want you to meet several pastor friends of mine there, son. After what happened today, I think it's time to loop you both in on something we've been working on for quite a while. It will be the three of us and your wives if they want to come along. Sure, said Carson. I'll let the girls know and we'll be ready to leave after service. Pastor shook Carson's and Paul's hands and got in his car and drove off. In the hills of northwestern Pennsylvania, Bryce Leonard walked out of the office that he held in a small town near where he lived. It was a small space in a discreet, nondescript warehouse building on the outskirts of town. In the area's heyday, it was used to smelt steel and later converted to warehouse space. The industry, long since moved out of the region now, it had been vacant for years when Bryce scouted it as a perfect base of operations for the group there. As Bryce walked out into the chilly night air, he lit a hand-rolled cigarette and pulled his collar up around his neck to repel the wind which was whipping down the lonesome street. Mostly vacant now, except for a few specialty shops, a gas station, and a small mom-and-pop grocery store, which had a neon light that flickered when the wind hit it. Other than the sound of an occasional car, all that could be heard was the squeaky chain from which the old sign on the gas station hung. Bryce started to feel uneasy as he walked along. At one point, he wanted to turn to look behind him, but caught himself and continued on his way. He pushed his hands further into his coat pockets, and he gripped the Taurus judge with his right hand. He spit his cigarette out from between his lips and listened intently to the surrounding environment. As he started to turn to go down a side road to where his Bronco was parked, two men in black hoodies and ski masks stepped out from the adjacent alleyway. When Bryce turned to face him, they descended on him quickly. The first man delivered a blow to Bryce's head. It was a shot that should have knocked him out. In fact, it would have knocked out most men. But Bryce Leonard was ready for it and he pulled back just enough to minimize the impact of the blow, which drew blood on his forehead, just above his left eye. Bryce reeled back and delivered a counter blow at his left hand when the big, solidly clenched fist connected with his assailant. It threw the man back through a plate glass window of an abandoned diner behind him. As the second man pulled the 1911 45 out of his waistband, Bryce fired the judge twice, hitting him with both shots. The first shot was a 410 double lot buck, which caught the man in his leather jacket and knocked him back. The second shot was a 45 long, which hit him square in the chest. The first man, now getting back up, pulled a pistol grip pump 12 gauge, which he had hanging from a shoulder strap under his coat. Before he was able to level it on him, Bryce fired two more shots in quick succession. Both the 410 double op buck and the 45 long hit their targets, and the man fell back through the broken window onto the diner floor. Both men were dead, Bryce looked around at what appeared to be an empty street. Before he could take off, the attendant from the gas station ran out into the street. He recognized Bryce. He had seen him many times in the neighborhood. Had he not come out, Bryce would have just disappeared into the darkness. But now he could not. He yelled to the attendant to call the police. When he went back inside to do so, Bryce called the area section chief for their group and told him what had happened. 
the sheriff's office sent two deputies out to the scene. While they were questioning Bryce, they received a call from the sheriff himself. Bryce stood by the cruiser, answering the deputy's questions as he watched the other deputy talking on his cell phone a few yards away. He couldn't hear what he was saying, but he kept looking over at Bryce, and when he did, Bryce looked away, trying not to make eye contact. When the call ended, the deputy walked over and said to his partner, Okay, we have orders to let Mr. Leonard go, as he handed Bryce his ID back. The second deputy protested, Let him go. There are two men dead in the street here and a lot of unanswered questions. We can't let him go. We gotta take him in and sort this out. The first deputy looked over at his partner and said, Well, that call that I just received was from the sheriff himself, who just happens to be on a vacation with his family in Colorado. He made it perfectly clear that we are to let Mr. Leonard go. Apparently the military will be handling this matter. The second deputy looked at him, stunned for a moment, speechless. Then he looked over at Bryce, who again tried to avoid eye contact with him by looking down. The first deputy stepped forward and huddled with his partner. Jim, the sheriff himself called from his out-of-state vacation. Not one hour after this incident happened to let us know personally that the military will be handling this investigation. In all your years of service, have you ever seen things happen so quickly before? You think about that for a moment. He then turned to Bryce and said, Have a great evening, Mr. Leonard. You're free to go. Without hesitation, Bryce got up and said, Thanks, Deputy. You have a great evening as well. Stay safe out there. And he hurried away. <laughs>